want you to think about two things this morning as we begin our study. First of all, what is the most beautiful place you have ever visited? What is the most magnificent place you've ever seen? I think for Kathy and me, it may have been the Taj Mahal in India. It's an incredible building built there as a, one of the kings of India for his wife, or one of his wives, and it is a magnificent building. It has some of the same uh, materials in it as that are found in the book of the Revelation in the new heavens and the new earth. It was very beautiful, certainly not as nice as that. Then think with me about what is the most miserable you have ever felt. What is the most painful thing you have ever experienced? We've had several people in our prayer request this morning talk about broken bones, talk about painful experiences, talk about illnesses. I can remember one Christmas when we all had the flu. It was not a merry Christmas. I can also remember a time when I was speaking at a pastor's conference in South Louisiana. We were living in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I'd flown down there. Kathy was in Dallas because Donna was having some surgery. And I woke up early one morning and went jogging, as I frequently did back in those days. Still do occasionally, when my breathing allows it. But uh, I had run, oh, a mile and a half, two miles that morning. Came back in, took a shower, sat down on the bed to get dressed, and suddenly doubled over in pain. As I found out later, it was a kidney stone. And as one lady told me, she had had five kidney stones and three babies and she said the kidney stones hurt worse than the babies. Very painful. Well, Paul, in this passage of Scripture today, is going to address the problem of pain. And I think this is very appropriate because for a lot of people, life is filled with heavy-duty pain. We might call it industrial strength, suffering. It may be physical. It may be emotional. Some of the kinds of physical pain have been mentioned today. Uh, cancer, as our friend Diane has, kidney stone, as my niece Beth has, broken bones, as uh, several people mentioned this morning, pain in the back, pain in the head. Uh, there are several kinds of headaches, migraines are among the worst, and arthritis and bursitis. I won't take a poll today, but I suspect that every one of us has some painful things in our lives. Emotional pain can include broken relationships or divorce, a rebellious teen, a prodigal person, abuse, even assault, illness of a family member, a child, a parent, perhaps a parent with dementia or Alzheimer's. All of these kinds of things bring pain into our lives. And so this morning we're going to consider, first of all, the prelude to Paul's discussion, then the problem of pain, then the purpose of the problem, and the perspective that Paul gained from this. Now the prelude is a pretty incredible thing. It actually involves a visit to paradise. I mentioned the beautiful places that some of us have been. Uh, Paul is going to explain in the context, as you recall from last week, he is answering the, the Corinthians and, and trying to under, get them to understand that he is the legitimate apostle. He is their spiritual father. And these usurpers, these so-called super-apostles, as they referred to themselves, were actually pseudo or fake apostles. And he's got, gone through all kinds of his experiences, his uh, Hebrew um, legacy and lineage. He also says in verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In other words, I'm even more of a minister of Christ. And again, uh, he's using a little sarcasm here. Talks about labors and stripes and prisons and deaths, uh, threats of death, the stripes that he bore and all of the things. He was in, in the ocean for a day and a night, uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea, and all these different dangers. And then the very last thing he tells about, in verse 32 of chapter 11, he says, the governor of Damascus was guarding the city and wanted to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Now think about that. Paul says, 
I was let down out of the city wall in a basket. And then he shifts gears in chapter 12 and he begins to talk about this crowning experience, having drawn the connection with last week, a challenge to Paul's apostolic office. He now gives us this crowning experience he had. He says, necessary, not profitable for me to boast. And so I'm going to tell you about the visions that I've experienced, the revelations of the Lord. Some people draw a distinction between visions, revelations, revelation, a broader category, a vision being one kind of revelation. And then he begins to tell us in the third person. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or whether out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now think with me, why would Paul tell us about something like this in the third person? I think one of the reasons is he's trying to avoid pumping himself up the way these false apostles did. He's trying to be humble, but he has to address the fact they were claiming visions, they were claiming revelations, they were claiming to have more supernatural knowledge and authority than he had. So he's going to tell us about something that happened actually during the quiet phase of his ministry. Uh, after his uh, co co conversion on the road to Damascus, prior to his being let down in a basket, or after his being let down in a basket uh, there, it's not prior to his conversion, but it's after his conversion, but it's prior to the time when he began to do his missionary trips and to travel. And during those silent years, 14 years back, Paul begins to tell about this experience, and I, most Bible scholars agree that Paul's talking about himself here. And there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is the contrast about, I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body, and the fact that he was caught up into paradise, heard inexpressible things, Paul said, I'll boast about this person, but I'm not going to boast selfishly, except in suffering. Now think with me. The Jewish concept of heaven was that the first heaven was the atmosphere. The second heaven was the stars. The third heaven was the presence of the Lord, paradise. And that's, I believe, exactly what Paul is telling us here. He was caught up into the third heaven. We don't know where in the galaxies or where in the universe it is, but we know it's the presence of the Lord and that He was there. And this trip to paradise, as we might put it, this crowning experience of His, in a sense, is what gave Him the perspective that He gave back in chapter 4, verse 17, where He said, Our light affliction, momentary, is producing in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's how Paul was able to look at his sufferings and say, we may have this terrible suffering now, but what we have to look forward to is just unbelievable. Some of you know how that feels from your days when you were younger at Christmas time. You suffered and suffered and suffered and waited and waited and finally Christmas morning came and that bicycle was there under the tree or that tricycle or that doll or whatever it was and you were thrilled to death. This is that to the nth degree. This is far beyond. Paul says and he says, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body but he says this individual, speaking of himself was caught up. The word is the same word used in 1 Thessalonians 4 for rapture. Talking about what's going to happen to all of us as believers when the Lord comes back. We're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul was caught up, given a preview into paradise. And while he was there, he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. We, we don't know what those were. We don't know why those were. But we know that Paul was given some insight, some revelation that was far beyond that of any of these false teachers. And Paul says, I would boast about such a person, but I'm not going to tie it to myself personally, except in my infirmities. Notice that for 14 years after this crowning experience of Paul's lifetime, he continued 
to deal with a weakness. <clears throat> and that sets the stage for the problem. And when we have problems, when we have pain, what is the first thing that often comes to our mind? What is the question that we typically ask? Why? Yeah, we want pain relief. We want to know why. We want to know why is this happening to me? Why this? Why me? Why now? Why not somebody else? Don't they deserve this more than me? We don't always put it that way, but that's kind of how we feel. <clears throat> and it's very simple to, to have that kind of experience. And uh, Paul says, lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. There's the problem. Sudden, unexpected pain. And I want you to think about three things with me about this pain. Number one, it was a serious problem. When you read this and you say, well, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, you may think about the little briars that you get off your rose bushes. How many of you have rose bushes around your home? We do. Okay. Occasionally you're working with those rose bushes. What do you do? You scratch yourself with a thorn. This is not that kind of thorn. How many of you have ever been picking blackberries? Have you ever done some of that? When I was a kid, I picked blackberries and sold them for a dollar a gallon. You know how long it takes to pick a gallon of blackberries? You don't even want to know. <laughs> Way too long. But the bottom line is this. The blackberries would scratch you. But this is worse than that. The word that's used for a thorn literally could be translated a stake. In other words, it's like the kind of stakes that were driven into Jesus' side and into his hands, the nails in his hand. The word that's used is a very graphic word for a large and pain-causing item. <clears throat> the word is scallops. Thorn in the flesh is given to me. It's a serious problem. Now you're immediately asking the question, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? The answer you may not like. We're not told. You may wonder why not. Well, there are a lot of things we can speculate on. Paul fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, according to 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe he suffered an injury there. That's possible. Could have been his eye problem. In Galatians, he said, you people love me so much, you would have plucked your eyes out and given them to me. And I had to write with very large letters. The speculation is that Paul had some kind of ophthalmic disease, some kind of disease of the eyes. We don't know for sure. But I'll tell you why we're not told. We're not told for the same reason that we weren't told what threatened Paul's life back in Asia Minor in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I believe it's so that you will be able and I will be able to relate to Paul's experience here. Because you see, we human beings, we like to compare things, don't we? We like to categorize things. We like to say, well, you have arthritis, but I have crippling arthritis. You have a headache, but I have a migraine. You have a broken bone, but I have some very painful broken bones. And, and so sometimes we might look at Paul's, and if he told us what it was, we might be tempted to say, yeah, Paul, you've had that, and God took care of you in that, but my pain is worse than that. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget one night I was uh, hosting my radio program, and a lady called in, and she told several bad things that had happened to her. And I was reminded of Job. Any of you remember Job? Remember all the stuff he went through? All of his children were killed, seven sons and three daughters in a tornado. We in Texas can relate to that. Uh, he lost all of his possessions, his wild, his animals, his sheep, his cattle, his donkeys, everything he had. The only thing he didn't lose was his wife. <laughs> she told him, curse God and die. He could have done without that. But the fact of the matter is, as, as I shared with this lady, I said, what you've told me Reminds me very much of all the suffering that Job went through. Oh no, you don't understand. Job didn't suffer anything like what I've suffered. And I said, are you kidding me? Uh, Job is the epitome of suffering. And here Paul is the epitome of suffering. This is a serious problem. Now it's a physical problem too. Because it's a thorn in the flesh. 
Uh, we've heard several things today about uh, people who suffered uh, a great deal of pain. Uh, some of the prayer requests that we shared this morning, uh, individuals going through physical pain, uh, cancer can cause pain, broken bones certainly cause pain, physical pain, and I can think of some friends of mine, there's a young man named Gus Gustafson, who lived up in uh, Nebraska, we met him up there, and when he was a young man, he was riding around with his dad on the tractor, and he fell off the tractor and somehow his arm was captured, and he wound up losing one of his arms. Amazingly, Gus was able to later write a book called Fully Armed. In fact, I don't know, John, you guys may actually have that book in your bookstore. It's a possibility. It's a, a long-term bestseller, but very positive, very encouraging from somebody who suffered a great deal of pain from losing a limb. A physical issue, and as I said, a problem of sudden, unexpected origin, but we don't know what it was. But I know that many of you this morning have pain of some kind in your life. It may be physical pain, it may be emotional pain, whatever kind of pain it is, what are you going to do about it? And that brings us to the purpose of the problem. Three specific agendas I want you to think about. Number one is Satan's. Paul says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Notice he didn't say who gave it to him. Some people read this and say, God gave it to him. I was reading the commentary this week. They were just insistent. God gave him the thorn. Well, I believe God used it, but I don't believe God gave him the thorn. God is a good and loving God. And other people read a messenger of Satan and say, well, Satan gave him the thorn. And that certainly is one way to look at it. But actually, I think Satan is an opportunist. You know what an opportunist is? Somebody that takes advantage of a situation. And I believe that that's exactly what Satan does. He likes to take advantage of when you're going through hard times. So then where did Paul's thorn come from? Have you noticed that we live in a fallen world? We live in a world where sickness and decay and death even happens. I went to my doctor, a specialist, a laryngectomist or whatever they call her. Anyway, she's good. She looked down my throat you know, they uh, typically look down your throat when you go in for laryngitis. And since I use my voice in ministry uh, for preaching and for radio and other things, I, I like to take good care of it. And she told me something that I really didn't like to hear. She said, you have signs that you're getting older. I can tell from looking at your voice. I said, what do you mean, signs? I'm not, my hair is not the same shade of red it used to be. My body is not as strong as it used to be. But how can you tell me my voice is getting older? But she did. So the reality is we live in a fallen world where decay happens, where our bodies decline, where we don't have as much energy as perhaps we once had. Anybody relate to that? We, we get tired easier. We, we struggle with things that we once could handle very easily. I can remember days when I could jog for five miles. Then I could jog for two miles. Then I could jog for one mile, and now I can barely make one mile. So, you know, it happens. But Paul said Satan had a purpose in this agenda. His purpose was to buffet me. Uh, that word to buffet is not the word buffet. Don't misunderstand that word. You know, a buffet is something where you have a vast amount of food to eat, like most of us did at Thanksgiving. This word to buffet is more like it's like giving somebody a black eye. It's like beating somebody up. That's the idea. And I believe that Satan wants to use the pain in your life and my life to discourage us, to defeat us, to cause us to want to give up. And some of you have been going through some hard times. And you've heard the kind of whispers that Job's wife once heard. Remember Job's wife, Mrs. Job? Remember what she told her husband? Curse God and die. You know where she got that idea? From Satan, who told the Lord, yeah, let me give him a hard time. He'll curse you to your face. And I believe that he used Mrs. Job to deliver that message. And I believe that Satan, the opportunist, wanted to use this message to buffet Paul. And the present tense there indicates this was an ongoing thing. He continued to be buffeted. 
Now, what was Paul's purpose in all of this? Satan's purpose is to discourage us, get us to give up, get us to quit. Paul said concerning this thing, verse 8, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Our purpose in two words, pain relief. Somebody mentioned that earlier. That's really what we want when it hurts. You know how I know that? There's a pharmacy on almost every corner in our world today. In fact, there may be more pharmacies than there are Baptist churches in Texas. I mean, if there's not a Walgreens, there's a CVS. There's not a Kmart, there's a Walmart or a Kroger or whatever. They're all over the place. And you go into all of them and you find shelf after shelf of what? A lot of other things, but a lot of aspirin, a lot of ibuprofen, you've got Tylenol, you've got Advil, you've got Aleve, and you've got all these different kinds of... And, and that's just the stuff on the shelf. That's not the heavy-duty stuff they keep back in the back locked up. There is a lot of pain, really. And that was Paul's agenda. Lord, take this away from me. Lord, give me some relief. What was God's agenda? I think the clue is found back in verse 7. Let me read it again and see if you can figure out what was God's agenda. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Did you catch it? Lest I be exalted above measure. He repeats it. He says it twice. And he says... And, and this kind of very validates our view that he was the one that went to heaven in the first seven chapters. Because he said the abundance of the revelations could have made me proud. You know, I've heard some people talking about uh, President George H.W. Bush who passed away. Uh, what a great president he was. And many people were talking about how they spent time with him. And it was obvious they were very proud of that. And Paul could have been very proud because he got to go to heaven before his time. He got to make a trip up there and to visit and then come back. And he could have said, boy, you should have heard what I heard. You should have seen what I said. You should have seen that street of gold up there. You should have seen the, the mansions that God's preparing. And, but he didn't. He said, God, let me, lest I be exalted above measure. Lest I become proud. You see, I believe Paul's Weakness might have been pride. And I believe God's purpose was to shape Paul's character and strengthen his hidden weakness. And if you don't get anything else out of this message today, I hope you get this, that God's purpose in allowing pain in our lives is to shape our character and strengthen our hidden weakness. We see that example with Paul. God did not want Paul to be proud. He was a Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, uh, really worked to keep the law blameless as touching the law, and he could have been very proud. But God used that thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. I think of David in the Old Testament. David had a weakness. His weakness was lust, and that weakness came out when David wound up having the affair with Bathsheba and then having her husband Uriah put to death to cover it up. That was David's weakness. Even godly Job, I mentioned him earlier, had a weakness. In Job 3 verse 25, Job says, The thing that I feared most has come upon me. See, here was Job, all the wealth that God had given him, all the blessings, the children, the family, and yet he was afraid and the most thing he was afraid of was of losing everything he had. I'm not sure if any of us can relate to that, but many times I've known the people who were fearful. I can think of one man I knew who was incredibly wealthy, started a chain of stores and uh, real estate development, and he was very fearful about losing everything that he had. It was a weakness that he had, and he acknowledged that. And I believe that that was Job's weakness. And I believe God wants to use the painful things in our lives to help us to strengthen our hidden weakness.